Okay, so um, instead of doing what we were going to do, which is going on to the next entry in um, meditations, we're going to go back to the entry that we've won for three sessions, uh, which is a 2-1. Uh, but I have a reason, okay? And the reason is um, for those who did not hear the, oops, hold on a second here. I got to close my WhatsApp. For those who did not hear the news, um, we had big news yesterday. Uh, I'm going to share the screen. So I just put a one-liner summary um, from this email I get, the Jewish Insider Daily Kickoff, um, which says, in a one-two punch for the Iranian proxy groups, Hamas said that its political bureau leader, Ismail Haniya, was ass assassinated in Tehran. Uh, hours after Israel bombed the Beirut home of Hezbollah military commander uh, Fouad Shakur, uh, Jewish insiders Lahav Harkov reports. Okay, fine. So um, it's funny because like I feel like everyone's talking about Hania and like this other guy who was also a really, really bad guy, you know, just doesn't get as much uh, attention. So whatever. Okay, so um, to give a little bit of background about, you know, response to this, uh, this is an art a short article. I'm going to read the whole thing written by a friend of mine, uh, Rabbi Scott Kahn, uh, entitled Death of a Moderate. Uh, and the, the little teaser of the article says if, you, says, if you read the Washington Post, you'd assume that Israel killed one of the good guys. So he says, if you read the Washington Post today, you learned that Ismail Haniya, Hamas's political leader assassinated in uh, the, sorry, the Hamas political leader assassinated in Iran less than 24 hours ago, quote, was considered one of Hamas's more politically pragmatic leaders. He was, quote, one of the moderate figures within Hamas compared to the other hawkish leaders or personalities. His assassination, according to Professor Jerome Gunning of King's College London, will, quote, push back a ceasefire and a two-state solution, uh, an opinion echoed by researcher Eric Scar of University of Oslo, who is afraid that the new leadership will, unlike Hania, not be in favor of a Palestinian state living side by side with Israel. In short, Israel eliminated Hamas's good guy, the militant who could also respect a peace process and an eventual accommodation with the Jewish state. So that was what, I guess, voices in the news were saying. Okay. Then Rabbi Khan says, that is a horrible mischaracterization of Ismail Haniya, the thieving billionaire butcher of Hamas who knew how to get credulous Westerners to eat out of his bloody hands. He spoke in the measured tones of a diplomat, but the words he said were murderous and evil. The joy on his face as he bowed down in thanks to God after watching Hamas's murderous rampage on October 7th on television is enough to make one's blood run cold. Hamas murdered 1,200 people that day and would have killed thousands and millions more had they been given the opportunity. Ismail Haniya was an essential piece of the Hamas puzzle and was directly responsible for countless deaths of Jews. What about his acceptance of a two-state solution? Indeed, Ismail Haniya proposed a two-state solution. That is, a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza with Jerusalem as its capital, along with all Palestinian refugees, quote-unquote, allowed back into Israel, but one which would be perennially at war with Israel and would make no promises to live peacefully by its side. In fact, his plan included a refusal to recognize Israel and an implicit promise that after several years, the now extant Palestinian state would resume attacks in order to conquer the remainder of the Jewish state. He did not even hide his intentions. He said the quiet part out loud. In his words, in his own words, quote, we will continue the resistance against the enemy until we liberate our land, all our land. Uh, the Washington Post is far from unique. In their rush to vilify Israel, too many media outlets have mischaracterized Hania as a moderating voice when, in fact, he was an integral part of Hamas and was fully on board with the, that terrorist organization's murderous Jew-hating ideology. He was, a, he was moderate compared to Yahweh Sinwar, Hamas's leader in Gaza, just as Hermann Goring was moderate compared to Joseph Goebbels. Goring was a more civilized face than Goebbels, but they both were integral parts of the evil Nazi regime. Both would have been put to death by the Allies had they not killed them first. Unlike Goring, uh, Ismail Haniya did not escape. Someone out there made sure Ismail Haniya received the punishment that he deserved. Okay, so that's, uh, I wanted to read it just to provide background because I don't know how many people follow, you know, this news. Okay, so what I want to focus on this evening is I saw four reactions on social media. Okay, and I made this into a Punnett square, all right? So on one side, you have a position that says it's good to feel good when a Russia, when an evildoer dies, and then you have bad to feel good when a Russia dies. And then on the other side, you have when the Russia's death leads to good versus when the Russia's death leads to bad or might lead to bad. OK, so I basically saw four reactions. OK, you have one reaction, which is it's good to feel good that Hania and Shakur were killed, especially in this case when their deaths will lead to good. OK. Then you have, it's bad to feel good that Hania and Shakur were killed, even though in this death case, their deaths will lead to good. So in other words, people who believe that this is a good thing for Israel, for the world, but you shouldn't feel good because it's bad to feel good. Okay. Then you have another side that says, um, it's good to feel that Hania and Shakur were killed, 
but in this case, their deaths might lead to bad. So in other words, there are people who have no moral problems where they feel it's morally good to feel, to rejoice at these deaths. But, you know, what if this leads Iran to retaliate? Or what if um, there is, what if this makes it harder to get the hostages back? Or what if, um, you know, this creates long-term problems? Or what if, you know, all this bad stuff that might happen? You know, what if this de destabilizes the negotiations, okay? And then the most extreme position is it's bad to feel good that these two guys were killed, especially in this case when their deaths are going to lead to bad. OK, I think that basically covers like the different reactions you could have. OK, um, now I know what what my position is. OK, but what I wanted to explore tonight is what Marcus Aurelius would say. OK, uh, possibly. And what the Torah position is, not that there's one Torah position, but I want to focus on basically, you know, what my understanding of the Torah's position is on this issue of is it good to feel good when a bad guy dies or is it bad? And then does this change if the death of this Russia is going to lead to good versus not? Okay. Those are the two broad topics I'd like to cover uh, tonight. Yeah, Isaiah. So I know these are like the four options you saw on social media, but like you have to say that um, it's good or bad to feel a certain way in response to a Russia dying. You don't have to. And I was wondering if, uh, you know, the downside of making a, a, a table like this is that it, um, it it's binary, you know, or quadrinary, whatever you want to say. Um, and uh, and there might this might this might be a false dichotomy. OK, so we have to keep that in mind as well. Um, so um, I guess the question is, in terms of what you're saying, like, well, let me let me ask you, what would the alternative be like? What would yeah, what would just how would you uh, state the alternative? Your emotional response doesn't matter. Okay, you could say it doesn't matter. That's one possible uh, non-binary response. The other one is to say that like it should be neutral, right? Like you should have like an indifference, you know, to it. I think, right? Okay, yeah, so like... we'll keep those two in mind as well. All right. So, um, what I, I want to, um, I, I, you know, ordinarily in the style that that I would give a share like this, then then I would ask you guys what you think. But I really want to folk. I want this to be rooted in the in the text. Okay, so we're gonna immediately jump into the into the text, and um, those who were not here for our analysis of meditations two one, I'm glad because this will be a fresh perspective. And those who were here, um, you know, then uh, this might I don't know this might be a good application to this. Okay, someone. Uh, Okay, I looked through all my resources to see, does Marcus Aurelius ever talk about this issue, about either issue directly, okay? I could not find any source other than the first entry in Meditations Book 2. Um, so we're going to look at that. And we do know that Marcus Aurelius did kill bad guys. I mean, from his perspective, he led wars and much of his, his career as emperor was going to war against the tribes and armies that were trying to defeat Rome. So we know that he did encounter the scenario. And I was even reading about this other case uh, called, oh, I didn't, uh, hold on a second, Asidius Cassius, uh, Avidius Cassius. So this guy, uh, I, don't, I don't know anything beyond what I read in this Wikipedia article here, um, but this guy it says in 175, Cassius declared himself emperor because he had received news from Marcus Aurelius' wife, Faustina the Younger, that the that the emperor Marcus Aurelius was about to die. Okay. Um, too soon though, because Marcus Aurelius, you know, came back. Okay. And um uh ChatGPT had a hallucination and said that Marcus Aurelius had this guy executed. And I said, Are you sure? Uh, because Wikipedia says that he did not have him executed, but he got uh murdered by one of um uh, by, by someone else, a centurion of one of his own legions. But the point is, is that Marcus Aurelius like faced this guy who tried to steal his empire and presumably he must have had thoughts or feelings about this, but I couldn't find any writings by Marcus Aurelius, certainly not in the meditations where he addresses this other than the first entry of the, of the meditations uh, book two. Yeah, Michael. Uh, I've heard Ryan Holiday discuss that uh, story and he says that he specifically decreed that nobody should kill him because he wanted to be able to exercise forgiveness. And once somebody killed him, he was like very depressed about it. Okay. So I did see the same thing, not from Ryan Holiday, but I saw that in the Wikipedia article. Um, and um, it's, I don't think we can necessarily infer from there 
about what he would say in these two issues because of the the um the political considerations involved you know for example he might have thought it was bad like maybe again I'm, I, I, this is total speculation maybe he wanted to show clemency because of the effect that that would have on the the empire you know um and maybe he felt bad that people were taking the law into their own hands you know so I, it's it, you know it it is possible that we can look into that and maybe find an answer to this, but I didn't find anything in the meditations. Okay, so let's let's start off by rereading this thing that we've read a bunch of times already. Okay, um, and uh, I'm just going to go ahead and cut to the uh, my favorite translation um, and try to answer based on on this. Oh, hold on a second, I don't want to tip my hand about Mishlei yet. Okay, so he says at the start of the day, tell yourself, I shall meet people who are officious, ungrateful, abusive, treacherous, malicious, and selfish. In every case, they've got like this because of their ignorance of good and bad. But I have seen goodness and badness for what they are. And I know that what is good is what is morally right. And what is bad is what is morally wrong. And I've seen the true nature of the wrongdoer himself and know that he is related to me, not in the sense that we share blood and seed, but by virtue of the fact that we both partake of the same intelligence and so a portion of the divine. None of them can harm me anyway because none of them can infect me with immorality. Nor can I become angry with my kins with someone related to me or hate him, because we were born to work together, like feet or hands or eyelids, like the rows of upper and lower teeth. To work against one another is therefore unnatural, and anger and rejection count as working against. Okay, now I'm not asking you to reconstruct what we came up with in the course of the two or three sessions that we spent on this, but based on this, what do you think he would, um, if he were in our position? In our position, I mean, you know. Jews or Americans who are, you know, who see uh, someone like Hania being assassinated, you know, based on this, what do you think he would say we should um, feel? And I'm specifically asking about the, um, the, this part of the, of, of the, of, of the, uh, the table here. Is it good to feel bad when the Russia dies or is it bad? Or like Isaiah was saying, is it, um, does it not matter or should you feel neutral? Okay. I guess those are the four options here. Okay, what do you say? Uh, I'm going to paste this into the chat just so people can look at it. Yeah, Michael? I mean, I assume at the very least you would definitely say that, like, it's not your decision. So it's a, it, it's a what was the term we used? Like a, a neutral? Indifferent. Uh, an indifferent. Indifferent, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so I think that's the very basic. But then, I mean, it seems like this, that he would say that there is a missed opportunity. So I don't know right. if he would say that means you did something wrong, but there is a missed opportunity that, you know, you all could, he had certain talents or whatever it is that you, you all could have a, uh, used to work together that you now missed out on okay and you're saying because um uh because this person who died was a human being who can make decisions and had certain qualities and in potential that person could have you know you could have worked with that person is that what you're saying yeah yeah the line like uh, by virtue of the fact that we both partake of the same intelligence and so of a portion of the divine Okay, so okay, so first of all, I'm just gonna try to just take notes here, just so we can follow the the flow here. So, so first of all, um, he would say that since you can't uh, control this person's uh, life or death, then it is an indifferent. Okay, um, meaning something that is uh, you know, just to, again, I'm gonna familiar because we got some new people here. So something not good or bad since the only good or bad is how you use your own will, okay? Um, second, he'd say that there, there was a loss of potential here because if we could get this Russia on board with, you know, working towards the common good, then that would um, set everyone else up for... Um, preferred indifference okay meaning um you know opportunities sorry opportunity opportunities to make good decisions easier okay all right i hear okay that's a that, that is good and, and we're gonna see i think that uh, i think there's an argument to be made in uh in you know according to judaism that that uh you know that there's a there's a basis for that approach although it's not it's not simple yeah Reza. Um, this might be a stretch, but I remember this passage reminded me of like just binaries and how they are both necessary because they show what the other one is more clearly. Like if it's political parties, like 
not that everything's opposite, but um, mm. if something's really bad, then you understand more clearly what good is. Okay. Um, and I don't think, I think that um, the stoic perspective on this would be, it wouldn't be to be ha like ang angry or not about it. Um, it would, it would be to just take it as something to further your own learning and like development and your own trajectory towards like your highest potential. Okay. That's very good. Okay. So there is, oops, sorry, hold on a second here. So there's a, uh, there's a, a, I'm going to call it, I don't know if this is the best term. There's an educational opportunity um, here, which is to uh, learn from the life and death of an extreme uh, Russia. Okay. In other words, from, you could look at this guy and say, you know, here are the decisions he made and here are the consequences that came from those decisions and here's the harm that he caused. And this is a, you know, the, the, the entire book of Mishle of Proverbs, you know, uses this exact method of, of looking at the extreme cases of the righteous and the wicked and the wise and the foolish, and then learning from those people. And, uh, and this is a, uh, this is a good uh, learning case. So, so, so I, I think in, in what you were saying, I don't know if you said this directly or if I just uh, uh, inferred this, but like, you know, if there is joy, it's in the the uh, the learning opportunity, and yeah. uh, you know for 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 him and for others, right? Meaning other people can also see that this is what happens when uh, when a Russia you know when a Russia lives this way, and it's you know Marcus really could rejoice in the fact that like you know this very very clear example is going to probably lead to a greater common good because people are gonna see that, oh, this is what happens when you live this way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Am I missing anything in what you were saying? No, I think that overall, most things could be taken in a positive way if it, if it develops you further. Right. Okay. That's also good, which is that um, this is based on the fact that there's no intrinsic good or bad here, but the opportunity comes from what you make of it. Yeah. Okay. Good. Isaiah. So kind of responding to what Michael had said before, yeah, I feel like that attitude of like the missed opportunity could be a dangerous sort of attitude because like you wouldn't say at a certain point you have to decide your enemies are your enemies. And like if you're going into battle, like you shouldn't be thinking, oh, well, this is a lost opportunity because I feel like, you know, you won't be able to view people in a real sense if you have that if you're trying to view it like this because like the real sense is like these people are your enemies right now and you need to fight okay so doesn't this view undermine your effort to eliminate a real threat um yeah michael you want to respond to that uh that counter argument uh, sure i mean i think i think you can separate from like the philosophical ideal and then practical reality so in reality there are people who use their i don't feel it's by free will but there, there are people who um, act uh, against the common good and it is for the best of the common good that those people need to be eradicated in some cases that doesn't mean that ideally they would uh, not return like idea i think ideally he would say they would return and in theory that is the best approach but there are going to be times though when that's not not that's not uh, applicable and in those cases uh yes i think he would recommend the have to you know to kill them. okay right Okay, very good. All right, I'm going to come back to that because I think that's the closest. I think this little dialogue here is the closest to my first uh, position on this. Okay, but first I will call on, uh, I guess, uh, House Hubert. I don't know what to call that group. This is kind of on the same topic. Um, I, I, I don't know that much about the Marcus Reilly style, but I can actually ask, what does he mean when he says at the start of the day, tell yourself? Is that something that he usually says or is that... Should we take anything from that or what? Yeah, so he, uh, we, uh, we talked about that a lot um, the first time, and um, he apparently felt like, so for, for the first, just background information. So he wrote this entirely for himself. Yeah. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was, uh, he, as far as he knew, this was never going to be read by anyone else. So he wrote this apparently that he needed to remind himself of this every day. Yeah. Uh, and the theory that we came up with is because there are basically two modes that you can be in. There's a mode where you um, define everything based on your own ego, where either people are, you know, for me or against me. And that is the attitude that produces these uh, annoying guys that he mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also an attitude that 
emphasizes distinctions between you and the other person or and that's like the default mode that we fall into because we're egotistical we start off as egotistical beings and like have to work at it but then the opposite approach is to recognize the commonality between you and the other person that we are both human beings and the only difference is that these people have less knowledge um of the good uh and that is what it allows them to do actions that are harming themselves really and so but if I don't keep reminding myself of this every uh, every morning, uh, then I, I I can just slip back into this. Like this is not an idea where you just get it and then you can like coast on it. But it, it, there's always this this um uh this the threat of the ego that that is going to come and uh, and you know and and could like pull you back in. So that's why I okay yeah. That. So, so that's what I was thinking. And, and based on that, I would say like looking at just what he's saying to tell himself. Where was it? it was um... sorry. Uh, uh, no, none of them can harm me anyway. None of them can infect me with immorality. The fact that he has to remind himself of that means that there is a mindset, or I guess maybe that mode where where a person would be susceptible to that. Yeah, which means that it would be a good thing that they're dead because it's ah. now something I don't have to worry about. Okay, all right, that's that's good. Also, okay, so um, uh, so we have here, Johnny is. Oops, sorry, hold on a second here. So Johnny is saying that um. The fact that Marcus had to, uh, you know, had to remind himself of this every morning, um, because he might fall into the trap of their mentality, shows that removing these people um, is a good thing for him developmentally, insofar as they, as you know, as they, you know. I'm going to say they might, you know, um, make him like, you know, uh, you know, come to resemble them. And I'm putting this in quotes because it would it would really be his fault. OK, uh, meaning he, he would have to make the decision, but they are they do pose a threat. OK, in other words, like they're a bad influence. Yeah. OK, uh, that's good. Also. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay, Tara and both have something. I'll just say to what Johnny was saying, I think that also, insofar as the, the back and forth between Isaiah and Michael, yeah, I think that then with what Johnny is saying, I think that could be then not an intrinsic good or an intrinsic something to be happy about, but which sounded more like what Isaiah was saying, if I was getting that, but it seems like this could then be not necessarily not an intrinsic good, but a potential for good insofar as um, what this overall situation could be. Okay, I didn't quite catch that. Um, are you sure. saying that the removal of someone who might be a negative influence on your character uh, can be viewed as a potential for good? And that's where yeah. So now, like an intrinsic good, right? Intrinsic good being like this is a a bettering of my character. This is not yeah. a bettering of his character necessarily, but the change in potential for uh, for either bettering or for, for or for making something for his character going worse. That there is a good in that removal. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Yeah. And then you said Tara had something. Yeah. So I, I I'm focused on uh, kind of the last few lines in particular. Yeah. Uh, where he's talking about uh, that that it's uh, members of his it's like members of his own body. Right. That, you know, it, it, to me, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to. And he says, you know, not or hate him. Because it, it it is a part of you, so it makes no sense to rejoice over the loss of your hands or to um and and to me what he's talking about is not necessarily bad or good, but compassion that right. there is that you remind reminding himself to have compassion uh and and understanding and and again going back to what he's talking about with uh, that they they don't have an understanding of good or bad. So it's more pity and compassion than than hate. And with that, I think that would remove the uh, the impetus to have bad feelings. Okay, so that's an interesting uh, idea as well. Okay, so so there is a thread of compassion through the entire thing, especially in the body analogy. Um, and uh, and that feeling of compassion might automatically um, preclude any sense of uh, of joy when uh these you know when 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 the the russia dies right meaning like it's like part of yourself is dying is that what you're saying yes that that's yeah. that's what i'm saying yep yep um, yeah michael you want to add to that 
Wait, oh, sorry, Johnny. Yeah, yeah. I think no, 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 no. They, they saw the same topic. Then all of our stuff. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay. Um, I, I was going to ask just another question, just not an answer, but uh, uh, the, the other way I was thinking was that he was saying, what, what does he mean when he says both are, are, are a portion of the divine? Because to me, yeah. that sounds like it would be like a bad thing if anyone dies, right? Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, I think I think that goes with Terrell's point is because he's saying that that um, you know they have a what you know to use our terms a telemelokim. You know they have a a, a a soul that can you know perceive truth and make decisions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have that same part, and uh, and I also work with them towards a society where we all are trying to use this part in that way. And so yeah, it would be bad if, if anyone died. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Michael. Uh, I just. Uh, I kind of have a response to that point, and uh, it's not, it might not be coming from this specific uh, passage, but more general yeah. Marcus Aurelius, is that I think you have to say here that he would have a sort of a obstacles away sort of mentality and tell you that even if you are losing out on something from having this per from losing this person's contribution, you still can not only use it uh, productively, but, you know, like a more fossil, like even love that this happened. Um, right. And I think you could even go as far as to say, like, okay, fine. So there was an ideal society that we could create with this person a part of it, but now that he's not here, that should allow us to form a different form of society that will also be great. And uh, the specific, the body analogy reminded me of, uh, I remember you mentioned uh, Bruce Lee with like his leg was a little short or something. Yeah. And uh, and he was able to use that to, I don't understand all of it, but to, to further his techniques. And yeah. so I think it'd be a similar thing here too, where even though we're losing a, a body part, we use that to become a better overall body. Okay, that's a good analogy, right. So in other words, uh, is it bad to uh, lose a, uh, a limb? Yeah, it's bad to lose a limb. Uh, because of the loss of potential for the good that you could do with that limb. But once you lose the limb, then that's the reality. And now you're, you have a different body and now you can, you know, that might afford you different, uh, um, uh, you know, options and abilities about how you can use that situation to your advantage. So, so that's another angle from which there's no intrinsic good and bad. I mean, there's no intrinsic good and bad because it doesn't affect your decisions. It doesn't make you a worse person, you know, like what Marcus really says in what is it? Four, eight, what is, uh, the only thing that's bad is what makes a man worse than he was. Um, and losing a limb doesn't do that. But it's also not bad because it really the only good is what you can what you choose to do with it. So you can choose to make uh, make more out of it. Um, so even even with these guys, meaning so just to plug this back into what you were saying earlier. So if, if you have let's again, I don't know who this Avidius Cassius guy was, but this Avidius Cassius, you know, presumably was a someone who was big in 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 high up in politics. And now he's dead. So he could have served the emperor in a great capacity and really helped everyone. But now that he's dead, we have to work with that as the reality. And we can we have to make that into something that is going to be beneficial for the uh, for the empire. Yeah. OK, uh, back to Reza. Oh, this kind of makes me think about um, how people find it easy to hate an invasive species. Like I work in ecology, so I'm kind of always thinking about um, the, the well, there isn't like morality in a forest, but um, people where I usually am are very upset about um, the fact that beech trees are going to be wiped out by beech leaf disease and beech bark disease. And they get so attached to like, you know, the forest the way that they like to see it. But mm -hmm. you can't necessarily, like if you hate the, pathogen that causes it like it, we're we're created from the same molecules that that is created from so that just reminds me of this this passage like right when you break it down to like it's most the basic parts like it's it's all the same stuff um but also the fact that there are these diseases kind of changing landscapes it makes people really think about why they love what they do about a forest and like their own connection to it and what it means to them so it's just this really interesting again opportunity for learning and like examining like the human psyche in relation to nature that wouldn't have come about if we weren't facing these just changes okay right so I, i'm going to try to summarize this by saying if you're a part uh a part of an ecosystem sorry ecosystem and you hate a part of that ecosystem that's just not going to be productive <laughs> right um it is uh you know it's it's you know it, yeah. You know, you know, and, and th that's that's what he's saying, uh, in the end. Okay, meaning like it, y you're stuck with it. Like you are stuck with. I mean, you could change stuff, but like j the feeling itself is gonna is gonna create a resistance 
against working with the scenario that you have. So it's just not going to be healthy for the decisions that you make in that way. Yeah. Okay. So I want to try to encapsulate this by, um, uh, or yeah, I guess I'll call on, on David's crew before this. Yeah. Um, so, uh, sorry, I just, I, I, I have a very clear, the first reaction that I had when I first read this is that yeah. if he's, if this is a mantra that he's telling himself, this means that it doesn't come naturally to him. Yeah. And specifically the second half, he eliminates the fact that these people alive or dead could ever have any actual negative effect on him, Yeah. which yeah. means that this mantra is him trying to manufacture sorrow like not like an all-consuming like going through the grieving process sorrow but kind of just like a like my mom was saying like a more compassionate gentle sorrow like you should feel sad yeah when you lose all of your top teeth like that would be a bad thing just like fundamentally like you lose the potential to chew your food in the way that you've chewed your food before um and like you should view Kind of, kind of like what uh, Johnny said already, where you should view the loss of any human life as a bad thing, but specifically you should view it as like a loss of opportunity that those people had to come to a greater knowledge and to be able to work with you. Um, but them existing would never actually cause you any harm. So you should feel a little bit sad when they died because all that you're losing is the opportunity. That's interesting. Okay, so, um, so if... Marcus is uh if Marcus is serious about the the idea that no one can harm him um and if he's serious about the idea that we're all you know we're all part of a system that can work together then the only emotion he would feel um or he should feel I guess the only emotion he should feel should I'll say should or would feel is sorrow at the lost potential. Yeah, that that's uh that is I think similar to Michael's first point about um uh the loss of potential here that that really is you know every human being is 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 it can be potentially good and like you know that's uh that's all he's going to feel. Okay, so from there I want to segue into the first source that I want to look at from Judaism, okay? Um well I'll I'll, I'll just I, I'm curious actually what anyone's associations are to what we've said so far um in terms of judaism how well, judaism's stance again i'm treating judaism as a monolithic like what's judaism's position even though there's obviously a lot of diversity here so i'm just using it in speech for for you know for uh convenience purposes yeah tamar what would judaism say about um, what we said there's a pasuk but i don't remember the wording exactly that god doesn't desire the death of the russia but rather oh, that he that's would exactly die. where i'm going <laughs> okay yeah all right so let me let me just go there right now uh, and then I'll call on other people because I I I, uh, I think they'll just connect really well with what we're doing. So in Ne'ilah, which is the uh, final prayer that we say on Yom Kippur um, at the end of this intensive period of uh, of introspection and uh, repentance, we say, I'm going to read it in English here. And you, capital Y, in your abundant mercy, have, have compassion on us for you do not desire the destruction of the world. As it is stated, actually, I'm going to highlight the key parts here. You do not desire the destruction of the world. As it is stated, seek Hashem while he may be found, call him while he is near. And it is said, let the wicked abandon his way and the man of iniquity his thoughts and let him return to Hashem and he will have compassion on him and to our God for he pardons abundantly. And you, God of pardon, are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abundant in kindness and truth and abounding in goodness. You want the repentance of the wicked and you do not desire their death. As it is stated, so this is from Yechezkel or Ezekiel, uh, say to them as, I, as truly as I live, declares the master Hashem, I have no desire for the death of the wicked, but only that the wicked return from his evil path and live. Uh, and it is said also in in, in Yechezkel, the same same verse, return, re return from your evil ways. Why should you die, house of Israel? And it is said, do I desire the death of the wicked, declares the master Hashem? I desire rather that he return from his evil way and live. That's also from Yechezkel. And it is said, for I do not desire the death of him who deserves death, declares the master Hashem, therefore return and live. Also from Yechezkel. Uh, for you are the pardoner of Israel and the forgiver of the tribes of Yeshurun in every generation. And besides you, we have no king who forgives and pardons only you. So again, you, you got to get the context here. This is at the pinnacle of the, you know, the we've had 40 days of working on ourselves on one level and then 10 days of intensive working on ourselves. And then Yom Kippur is the day where we devote ourselves to, 
you know, to Teshuvah and forgive, you know, asking God for forgiveness. And the message is God does not want wicked people to die. Okay. So the question I always used to have here is really? So then why does he have death penalties for the wicked? You know, why does, why are there so many cases in the Torah where he, he punishes the wicked, you know? So my theory, and I'm going to share this theory because I think, you know, um, this is just repeating what we just said is there's really two frameworks here. Okay. There's the framework of God and the individual, and then there's the framework of the individual in society or God and society. Okay. If it was just God and Hitler, God would not want Hitler to die. He would want Hitler to do teshuva, to repent, to examine his actions and to make the right choices and to live. And if you argue with that, I mean, then you're arguing with all of these, uh, you know, these verses here. I mean, he says, even the one who deserves death, he does not want him to die. Okay. But at the same time, the wicked person poses a huge threat for the society. They're actively harming people. They're harming people in ways that, you know, they're modeling bad behavior that is tempting. They're, they're, they're seducing people with their, with their value systems. And that poses a threat to society. And it is a, a balancing act in the Torah and in, you know, any person who's like living their life, who has, you know, influence over the, the, you know, uh, any area of society, it's a balancing act of like, you know, do you, give this person another chance and try to get them to repent or do you are they a threat and you have to annihilate them or 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 you know penalize them before they affect others in a bad way and you know the torah built in has has a certain system for doing that and then we also have principles by which we have to make these decisions ourselves so i think that really reflects what you guys were saying which is that on the one hand every Russia is a potential tzaddik. Every bad person is a potential righteous person. And the loss of any human being in that sense is a real tragedy. But at the same time, you have to be practical and you have to realize that that there are, you know, you, you can't give this person infinite chances and you can't just like let them do evil if other people are, are if there's a collateral damage there. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think that that, you know, is, uh, that's my understanding of God's position and how you can have, God saying, I don't want wicked people to die. And you have God killing wicked people. That's, I think, my uh, my my uh, my understanding of that thing in the Elah. So I'll, I'll, I'll take comments and questions here uh, uh, you know, before we go on to the next piece. Yeah, Tamar. Or I'll, I can come back to you if you're unable to get to the uh, Zoom right now. Uh, let's go with Isaiah, although they're in the same house. So <laughs> maybe, yeah, Isaiah. In the other room, so I'm not sure. Okay, sure. Um, yeah. But I had two associations to, I guess, what Marcus really is wrote here in Judaism. Mm -hmm. One of them I think just touching on is like the, the dichotomy of Minas Adin and Minas Rachman. Where I like, I'm just going to uh, translate that. So the Minas Adin is, people call it the attribute of strict justice, and Minas Rachman is the attribute of mercy uh, in relation to God. Uh, but we don't, we maintain that God does not have any a actual attributes. Um, uh, meaning any actual qualities because God is one uh, and there's no divisions or qualities or characteristics in him. So uh, what we mean by that is that God has two ways of relating to people. Mercifully, um, which means seeing, relating to them in terms of their potential uh, and giving them a chance to change their ways and then, uh, or through strict justice, meaning, you know, you need to be punished or or stopped in some way, uh, in order to stop you from doing evil. Yeah, go ahead, Isaiah. I guess I was thinking about it. It feels to me like we sort of have to relate to the situation through Minas Rachim, because like we can't really understand like exactly um, how Hashem would judge like people in this situation. And so like we're, it's, it's a loose association, but like we have to view it from a sense of like, we don't know what the best thing is from this person's life and how we can best relate to it. So we just have to like take from it what we can kind of. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, yeah. I think that's, that's a good point. And I'm actually going to hold my comments on that until we get to the third part of this, uh, which is about, um, huh? about how we live with, without absolute knowledge of the future. Okay, so I will hopefully I'll remember to come back to what you're saying when we do that. Yeah, yeah. The other the other association I had was to the Ramam, who says that there's no evil caused by God. 
Uh huh. Right. Yeah. Uh, that is a very good, uh, a good Rambam, and uh, I will just nod and acknowledge that without, because that that that's opening up a metaphysical can of worms uh, to talk about uh, to talk about that in depth. So we'll we'll hold off on analyzing that. But uh, I agree with with why you're associating to it. Yeah. Okay. So any other comments? Yeah, David. Yeah. One other thing I think also is different is just in so far as the difference, uh, the quality of difference between God's knowledge. God's knowledge and man's knowledge that, I mean, I think like these Pesukim are talking about so far as God relating as you're saying to an individual or to a, a, how a person will affect society. Yeah. As far as people, we're, we are just limited in so far as our limit of knowledge. I think we can only say with the best of our knowledge, this appears to be a good or appears to be a bad in a way that God knows differently. Okay. Is that the same point about our limited knowledge that Isaiah was just making or a different one? Because to me, it sounds the same and I don't want to miss uh if you're saying if you're adding a new uh angle here okay i'm not sure okay so i, I yeah. then i'll hold off my comments on that also because that that is uh that's what I, I intend to go into uh in the third part of this yeah um, uh, yeah i have uh i was thinking when you're reading through that um thing in the ELA, i'm just realizing that it was all um i forgot that it was all from like you appealing to god and this is the way the way that god sees it yeah um and like obviously we are supposed to emulate god in some ways but like just thinking uh, maybe this is more just like a Mishle type perspective that to me seemed like the what i would say like judaism's perspective on this would be which is that um it really depends on like what you're working on in your own development mm -hmm. as to how you should feel about it that, that like if you are a person who is working on your sense of compassion yeah. Then you yeah. can look at this in terms of the compassion that you feel. And if you if you are someone who feels like enticed by by you know certain things about like the way the evil the type of evil that this person embodied, um, then you should probably try to cultivate a sense of of rejoicing against that. Uh, yeah. so that you can kind of move and distance yourself from that. Okay, good. So th th this uh, is I'm a, we're gonna touch on this a little bit in, in part two. We're still in part one, by the way. So in part two, um uh, I'll, I'll, but I'll, I'll just like, uh, uh, you know, um, state it here in, in a general, in general terms, which is that, uh, it's, it's very tempting when you're reading the Stoics to focus on just which feelings are in line with reality and which ones are not like, which feeling, like if I am freaking out over something that I can't control, then that is uh, uh, a misguided emotion because I, I can't control this thing. So why am I, I freaking out about it? Um, uh, so, so that's true. But one thing that Judaism, I think, does, Stoicism does, does this also, but one thing that Judaism does explicitly is, is thinking about developmental tools. And like what Johnny's saying here is, is, well, which emotion do you lean into there's not necessarily a one size fits all answer. It depends on which emotion you need to work on. So, so you know, again, Ramam's whole uh, method of character traits is you have like every character trait has two extremes, uh, and they're both bad. And the middle is what really what you want to get to. And by middle, we mean not a quantitative middle, but you want to get to the point where your emotions will feel what whatever the situation warrants you know whatever your mind tells you makes sense in this case so just again just use a simple example that i like to use is you know if you are a spendthrift and you just spend whatever money you earn and you, you, know, you can't hold back that's bad if you're a miser and you just save everything even when you need to spend then that's also bad but to be frugal means that when rationality dictates that you need to spend money now then you're happy to spend money and when the situation dictates that you need to save money then you're happy to save money so Johnny's suggesting the same thing here, which is that here in the ELA, we are talking to God and God is going to look at things in terms of like accurate knowledge and total potential of all human beings. But that doesn't mean that you personally should, should have these feelings, you know, of, of compassion on every wicked person, you know, uh, even though we have this directive that we're supposed to emulate God, it doesn't mean that you feel in compassion when Hitler is killed is going to be good for your development. Maybe that's going to desensitize you to evil. You know, maybe you do need to feel, feel, uh, uh, re, you know, uh, you need to, to rejoice. Or maybe if you rejoice over the death of this, uh, 
this person, then that's going to be giving in to a certain cruelty or to other bad emotions. So it so it depends on on where you're at and what you're trying to 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 do with your own development. Yeah. Okay. So speaking of that, let's go to part two, which is Michelet. Okay. So on social media, I think the number one thing I've seen, and it really annoys me, is people will quote one of these two Psukim and Michelet, and they will not quote the other. Okay. So one is people, this is Michelet 24, 17 through 18. When your enemy falls, do not be glad. And when he stumbles, do not let your heart rejoice. Lest Hashem see and it be evil in his eyes and he turn back his wrath. God turned back his wrath from upon him. Okay. So that's quoted by people who say, oh, you know, Hania died and you're happy. But Mishlei says that that's bad because when your enemy stumbles, then don't don't rejoice. Okay. The other one is in uh, you know I, I actually hold on just a second here. I I want to just do the psukim before we quote the commentaries. Okay. The other one is in Mishlei eleven ten. Betuv tzadikim ta'alotz kirya uva avod roshaim rina, which means when the city the city exalts, meaning rejoices in the good of the righteous. And when the wicked perish, there is glad song. Okay, but I thought he said that you shouldn't be happy when the you know when uh, when your enemy is uh, is destroyed. Okay, now you know if this were a normal Mishlei Shir, we would analyze all of these in depth. But I'm just going to uh, we're going to skip all of the usual steps of asking all the questions and and doing everything. Just going to ask because I think we we have paved some of the way in in uh, in this discussion of Marcus Aurelius. Um, how would you reconcile these two? And I'll tell you. When I ask you how you reconcile them, I don't just mean plug in what we've already said. I think what we've said is going to inform how we interpret these two, but I think there are new ideas to be gained here. Okay, so how would you, what, what do you say on these? And when I say reconcile, I mean like under what circumstances, you know, what is the idea in this first set of Psukim in 24 and when would you apply it? And then when would you apply the second one? Or if it's like we've been saying about Marcus Aurelius that they both apply and there's like, they can both play to the same cases. How would you, how would you uh, differentiate? How would you contend with these two? As well, say yeah, Isaiah. Well, so for the second one, it's stating like a sociological fact to me. Ah, the, okay. the city does this. That doesn't okay. mean it's good or bad. So, so let's ramp it up. Um, I, I listened. Uh, I, I gave Sheer on this um, in uh, in November 2021, and so I, I re-listened to it. Um, and you had a good explanation. Uh, I don't know if you remember it, but. Um, there is another translation of this, which is the Sadigon's translation is the city should exalt, exalt in the good of the righteous. And when the wicked perish, there should be glad song. Okay, so let's, um, let's, I, I, and I'm not saying that the way that you read it before is wrong, because obviously it, it's a legitimate reading, but I think for our purposes, we'll, we'll use this translation just to create the tension. Yeah. Okay, Lauren. Um, maybe it's like what you were saying earlier. So maybe like the first case is it's like it's not you actually um, like harming your enemy. It's kind of like, you know, the bad things happening to your enemy, maybe not as a direct action of your cause, like maybe providence by God or natural disaster. And the second case is more of like in your society, you're getting rid of the Rashaim for the good of the overall society. Okay, so the distinction I think is a valid distinction, but number one, I don't see that distinction reflected in, in the wording. Okay. In other words, to me, it seems like you could read both of them as when something bad happens to the wicked, regardless of whether you had anything to do with it, like, you know, with the wicked perish, like they could be perishing in an earthquake or something. And then similarly, you would think that these two things actually all right, I'll, I'll leave it at that do you, you see what i'm saying like yeah i guess i guess i'm thinking also that why does it say rishai in the second part like the first one says i guess ah. so you know Aidecha is more of like your enemy a whole i'm thinking of like a whole society versus like a russia as an individual okay um, okay so I'm, yeah. I'm just gonna note that observation here because i think that hook is the hook by which many people um uh, resolve, you know, reconcile these two, uh, but uh, but it's not just one explanation. So so I'll say, you know, chapter twenty four says your enemy, whereas chapter eleven says the wicked. Okay, so I'll, I'll just leave that up as something that people can like think about and work with. Yeah, 
Okay. Uh, David and crew. Okay. The thing that confuses me is that it says when the wicked perish, there should be glad song, which is which is great. We've like this got this category of I would assume people, but then it says the city should exult in the good of the righteous, not yeah. that we're exulting in the righteous themselves. And I'm just wondering right. why that distinction is important for goodness and righteousness, or not goodness and righteousness, but like goodness and righteous people versus why just why just wicked why not why not specifically have glad song when wicked things happen by bad people or something okay. like that yeah so the, the the type of question you're asking is exactly the type of question that we would take up if this were monday night <laughs> um, and we and we would be listing all of the uh listing all the questions and then looking at all the subtleties here and what i'm you have to understand and this is probably making everyone else uh squeamish you have to understand how difficult it is for me to look at to Tsukim and Mishle and say, let's not ask any questions and let's just give ideas because I never do this. Like I, I this is, I, I, I literally have never done this in, in all my time. So I, uh, I, 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 you know, I, I'd be happy to take that up um, about the, uh, you know, at, uh, at some other, uh, some other point, but uh, right now we're just going to keep our eye on the big picture here. Sorry. Um, I have an approach that maybe answers Yang's question, but um, uh, and I, I don't know if this is similar to what Lauren was saying, but um, that the to me sort of in line with what we we're just talking about. That the first one is is um, it's addressing itself to an individual, and the second one is talking about what a city should do. Okay. So to me, that lines up with um, like a like what a city should do has to do with um kind of practically politically what does impact us on society to me that seems like a utilitarian based way of looking at it and then the first one kind of sounds like it's more talking about a developmental uh yeah. way of looking at it yeah okay good so um so uh i'd say like this so the the, the first uh you know so I, I'll, just, I'll just use 24 and 11 24 is saying that from a developmental perspective um there is a you know, there's, it, let's see, I'll just say there's a harm. I'll leave it vague for now. There's, there's a harm in rejoicing when your enemy falls. Okay. Um, but 11 is talking about the, you know, the, the developmental, um, I guess, norms for, for, for the entire city. And, um, and, the you know the, the the death of the wicked is something that for which celebration is beneficial celebration is beneficial okay so i'm going to ask two questions on that just to 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 tease out the idea so one question is um what is bad about rejoicing uh when your enemy uh when your enemy falls okay uh and then two um what is beneficial about celebrating the 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 destruction of the wicked. Yeah, Johnny gets first crack at answering this, but uh, I'll take other answers if anyone wants. This is just getting, you know, just a lot. Um, I'll, I'll get back to you. Okay, sure. Uh, uh, Isaiah, oh, sorry. Uh, w, you want to answer? Yeah, okay. <laughs> sorry, how's that? Um, I think, I mean, to that, I think if you're rejoicing so far as indulging the emotion of somebody's downfall, then that's going to be even like practically harmful to you. Um, cause you're not going to be, uh, like thinking straight, you're going to be more just indulging in that. Um, and then I think in so far as, I mean, the, the benefit of, of celebrating their destruction would be if this, I mean, wrecking ball of, of wickedness is no longer present, then you should be happy that it's easier to do the good now. Okay. So I like what you're saying for the second part. Uh, and I like what you're saying for the first part, but I think it still needs a little bit, uh, a little bit of clarity here. So, um, I like the phrase also when this wrecking ball, what do you say? I think wrecking ball of wickedness. Yeah. Wicked. When the wrecking ball of wickedness is removed, then um then uh that's you know that's that's good for the potential good of the of the city. Okay. Um can you name what like or not name, 
can you describe or define what is the distortion of thinking when if you when you rejoice when someone falls? Like sadistic. Or you're saying something different. What was that? Like sadistic? Okay. Okay. So it could be okay. I'll, That's not I'll, what I was. It may not be one answer. That might be one answer. So I'll say. I, you were saying it's a distorted way of thinking. Um, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, so I'm gonna say one is like, uh, you know, it's giving into sadism. That's one. I'd also say ego. It, it could be like the ego centered. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I I, I think in, in in one of two ways, either that that it has to do with you. It's like this is a good thing for me. Or that you were like it almost feeds into like a god fantasy of like like I caused this like this like I wanted this to happen and then I caused it like okay good, okay, good. Okay. I'm defining this by me or I am the the cause yeah so I I, I that was what I thought you meant W because that was what Marcus Aurelius was talking about in the meditations you know you're falling into that it's me versus them and like when they go down I go up and like. Uh, I don't mean that in the who who said oh I don't mean that in the Michelle Obama way I mean like when they have the downfall then like uh, I uh, you know that that's a score for me you know it totally removes you from the objective good common humanity framework that Marcus Aurelius was uh, was saying um, so again I don't think these are the only answers I'm sure there's other answers also but it's gonna be it is gonna be bad for you there okay good um, uh, oh, I had a, I had a comment as well sorry sure. um, and and it was independent of this but now it's fitting in really well I think yeah, yeah. with what's been said said um, is I feel like between the 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 two um, uh, proverbs that we were looking at that um, one is a um, view of mercy and one is a view hmm. of justice okay so having that, that first one um trying to cultivate mercy in your your view of others um and the second one is um rejoicing in justice yeah um so so rather than you know having mercy on the individual so it kind of goes into that whole individual versus people um, uh, sorry, individual versus the group, right? right? So, um, as, as a society, we should appreciate and recognize and rejoice in justice, but yeah. as an individual, we should have compassion and, and being able to have both of those exist at the same time okay. Is, okay. is important. Okay. That's really good. So 24 is compassion or mercy and 24. And eleven is justice, and we need to be to be able to toggle between these when appropriate. Um, when appropriate, yeah. Okay, so that that yeah, reconciles and, and, them by saying that that these are these are two frameworks that that we need to be able to see both of them in. It's not like this applies in one case across the board, and the other one applies in another case across the board. Yeah. All right. Good. Right. And and but I feel like that almost answers uh, the questions too. Because uh, what is bad about rejoicing when your enemy falls is that you are lacking mercy. Okay. This also right? answers, and, yeah. And and um, then what is beneficial about celebrating the destruction of the wicked is um, is that you're you're rejoicing in injustice. Yeah. Okay. Good. You're lacking mercy, and then um, rejoicing. You're rejoicing in justice, and I think. Would you say that rejoicing in justice is good because it, it it if I ask you yeah why is rejoicing in justice good what would you say I would say because um, I mean justice is a uh, something that we are are looking to um, I'm trying to put this in it's always hard to put in words okay so um, rejoicing in um, seeing um, things of rightness. I don't know exactly where I'm going with this, but um, so mercy is more of a, a having compassion on your limbs, right? Yeah. But you also rejoice when all of your limbs work together appropriately. Okay, right. Uh, yeah, so I, I think I know where you're going with this. Uh, so I'm going to say what you're, what I think you're saying, and then I'm going to say what, how I would answer it, which is, um, I, I think both of them are true, which, is, you know, which is good because A, uh, okay, I'm going to say like, and God saw everything that he created and behold, it was very good. Okay. Meaning like, uh, you know, objective good is intrinsically like, sorry, is intrinsically, intrin, 
intrinsically um uh like you know uh you know joy producing <laughs> okay and uh and you know the, the 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 analogy i always use uh in this is like okay this is a, this is a weird analogy but it works for me so i hope hopefully it works for some other people is when let's say you have a scientist who's who is working on a a theoretical problem in science like like we can't understand like how this phenomenon works okay and they're working on it for years and then finally they they come up with a theory and it perfectly explains the phenomenon and there's like this oh that's that is beautiful like the the universe is you know the the the, the uh you know I, I see the harmony and beauty in god's universe okay that's a certain type of joy now similarly when we look at the human realm and we see all these problems in society, there is disorder there. And that's not how things ought to be. But then when things are functioning properly and you see all human beings working together in harmony, there's the same type of like beholding the beauty of God designing the universe and it's it's good. Yeah, okay. I would say in addition to that, again, it's not, not contradicting that. In addition, that is that, um, that celebrating the good promotes the good, you know, and, uh, and this is beneficial for the development of all the citizens. Okay. And in the same way as like, um, uh, when like a kid does something that is, you know, morally good, you know, you, 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 uh, applaud them and, and celebrate them to encourage them to do it. So, so when we, uh, when we celebrate in the city, when someone bad is brought down, that reinforces people's attachment to the good uh and uh and 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 helps break their attachment to the bad yeah okay that's uh, that's really good okay uh Laura? is that what is that what it says with with glad song or with uh with rena with a song or whatever it is yeah it, that's like a publicizing way of of reacting to it not just like right. what do you think right as opposed to let's say like when your heart rejoices it's not you know it, it, it's it's public it's, it's it's an expression a public expression of song yeah that's good yeah uh lauren oh sorry that's a mistake Mm. Isaiah? Yeah, so at least for the city pasuk, we finally hit my idea, which yeah. I, <laughs> is what you were saying that having this rejoicing like teaches a lesson to the to the city that yeah. both in the good and both for the good and the bad that like this is the this is the um what do you call it like the 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 position of our city. You know that we rejoice for this, and we and we also rejoice for this. Um, right. But for the first pasuk, I was thinking about it. I think a little differently. Is that maybe there's like a practical lesson in the pasuk that if you let yourself rejoice when your enemy falls, then like that puts you in a state where you're like more likely to make mistakes because you're caught up in the rejoicing of like how great it is that my enemy is falling. And you might not realize that you're starting to make the same mistakes that he was, or you're just making mistakes. Um, that's maybe similar. Maybe it's like an ego idea like we talked about before. Okay, good. So the state of joy it, it, itself can lead you to make mistakes, uh, you know, because it's an egocentric joy. Yeah. Michael? Um, some people have kind of alluded to this idea, but I, I actually think that Shlomo is saying there's nothing intrinsically wrong with rejoicing at uh, your enemies uh, following, because when we're dealing with someone like a Russia who's, you know, who's preventing the, the goals of the society or the individual, they have every right to want to uh, have him out of the way. And then once he is, now it's going to be easier, easier for them to achieve their goals. And that, that's where the rejoicing over, like you said, it's going gonna, it's gonna to increase the likelihood of more people acting that way. Mm -hmm. I think the difference between these sukkim is what is the case. And yeah. when you're rejoicing, it's when they're completely gone. Whereas when they're, if mm. they only fall, clearly ah. they can come back up because that's the concern in the puzzle. That Hashem's going to remove his wrath. Yeah. So the question here is, it, intrinsically, there's nothing wrong. But if you're going to be gloating and then you'll be susceptible to like being blinded that he's going to come back at you, then you should control yourself. But okay. if he's completely gone, then just go for it because there's nothing, no reason. Yeah. Not to. Okay. That that actually works out very well. Um, I don't know if this disproves your interpretation of the puzzle. But if you look at Mishlei 24, 16, uh, which is the puzzle right before it, uh, Mishlei 24, 16, um, it says, uh, 
Kisheva Yipol Tzadik Vakam Rishayim Yikashlu Bara'a. That's the Tzadik falls seven times and gets up, but the Rishayim stumble in badness, which means the the, the the means that they permanently fall. You know, so I think it might be that that when that um, that in this particular case, stumbling is synonymous with with falling permanently. But I uh, but clearly, yeah. but clearly from look like at the end of the the, the psukim though, it says that Hashem's going to re- remove His wrath from him. Clearly, the concern is that He's going to come back. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. Yeah. All right. I I hear that. Yeah. I I I uh I think the uh the, that fits in uh, especially with what uh Isaiah was just saying uh and David about the uh, mistaken decision making. Okay. I'm gonna go to Tamar. Then I'm gonna read Rabbi Yonah, and then we'll go to part three. And I, I do want to stop by six th- or nine thirty, whatever time zone you're in. Um. Yeah. Tamar. It's actually just like a supplemental point, but um, Lauren had pointed out the word enemy versus yeah. wicked. Um, and I think that that fits with everything else that we're saying because the. The word enemy is like, it's oppositional. The, the Like, okay, as opposed to Russia or wicked, which is objectively bad. Yeah. Enemy is, it might actually be objectively bad also, but the word is defining it as like the opposition to you. Okay, good. And so that's uh, when you should be careful, which is the personal investment. Okay, good. I think that's the most straightforward answer. And that's the answer I chose to highlight from the commentaries. Okay. Again, there's lots of answers to this, but uh, Rabinu Yona. He actually explains this better in his commentary on Pirkei Avos 4.19, which also quotes the Pasuk. So I'm just going to quote it from there. He says, even when the enemy is a Rasha, one should not rejoice over the, his harm only because of Hashem alone. Meaning you should only rejoice about Hashem. By that, we mean that the Tzadik will not rejoice over the downfall of the wicked unless the intent of his joy is because the Rasha's downfall brings glory to heaven, but not because he hates him. Okay, so in other words, that I think is the distinction we were saying before of like, if you're happy because badness was removed from earth, you know, and now the good of, you know, uh, that Hashem desires for his creations can come to fruition. So then that's good. That's not a personal joy. But if it's like you hate this guy, if he's your enemy, then that's bad. And then he says, all the more so one whose actions are corrupt like him. And if his heart rejoices at the rush of stumbling, then his own uh, evil is great. Why should he rejoice when he's like him? So in other words, if you're as bad as this guy, you know, then you definitely shouldn't be happy because uh, he's he's just like you. So like, you know, by that logic, you should rejoice if you have your own downfall, you know? Um, and then in Rabin Yonah's commentary on Mishle 11.10, he says, um, it is possible to explain that this verse comes to explain that everyone is obligated to rejoice about the good of the righteous and cel- to celebrate the destruction of the wicked. As for what is written, do not hate your brother in your heart, in Vayikra or Leviticus 19.17, the Russia is not included in the category of your brother. Similarly, the sages said, a prince among your people you shall not curse. This applies only if he does the deeds of your people. So in short, he's not saying it as, as explicitly as, as I would uh, have seen other commentaries say it, but he's the only one I found who said it on both of them, uh, that the distinction here is the one that Lauren made and that Tamar's making, which is, yeah, when someone who is your personal enemy um, has a downfall and you rejoice, you're just giving into that egocentric feeling that Johnny was talking about before, and that's going to be harmful for all the reasons we said. But if an objective Russia dies, that's an objective good. But here's the catch, which is when the objective Russia dies, if you have a personal vindictive egocentric joy then that's maybe when you should exercise restraint and say, well, I'm not going to indulge in that because that's just giving into my own emotions. You know, like, like, uh, you know, let's say like, uh, you know, I'm sure there are people here who are not here, but like people in the world who see this person, uh, you know, uh, Hania die, and then all of their, you know, Islamophobia comes out or all of their like, you know, anti-Arab sentiment comes out, you know, that's not rejoicing because of the objective evil being destroyed that's object that's a rejoicing because of your own personal uh, issues you know so maybe that should temper it um and uh and, and you know the the opposite is true as well it's like just because someone does good you know does not mean that being that rejoicing about it that you're you know rejoicing because of of, of pure motives maybe you're just rejoicing because of some ego thing and maybe you shouldn't get all uh, all uh full of yourself because of that yeah lauren I'm also wondering if there's like a distinction between societies versus like the leaders of those societies who are Rishatim. Like That's how possible. the Torah right. the Torah treats like Paro versus Mitzrayim. Like we didn't think um what was it? we don't say full hollow on the last seven the seventh day of Pesach um because of the Kriya Yamsuf, how the Mitzrayim were, were killed. Yeah. 
Um, and also, like, I'm thinking about the Nevi'im and Yishayahu and Yirmiyahu and Yechezkel, they all have these, like, visions for the other nations where they're, yeah. like, some of them, like Yishayahu, he's actually, like, lamenting over their destruction. Right. So it's kind of like, it's it's just interesting mm-hmm. that um, we do have this concept of, you know, I don't know why he's being crying over the destruction of Babel when Babel did so much bad to us. Right. But, um, but he does that in his prophecy, yeah. so... Um, and, and I was just wondering, worse is like, yeah, you know, that, an actual Russian Nebuchadnezzar who is evil, you know, right. him dying is different than probably. Right. Right. So that, that again, I'll, a similar response to before is that, that I think that is definitely a good distinction about about how we feel about when the leaders die versus when the followers uh, don't, you know, the followers die. Um, but uh, I, I don't see that distinction reflected in in the in, in these two psukim. So I wouldn't I, I would want to see more evidence to before I applied it here. Um, okay, so let's move on to part three in the last 18 minutes here. So what we've done so far is we've only focused on this part, okay, is whether it's good to feel good when a Russia dies or bad to feel good when a Russia dies. I'd like to now focus on this part of should our feelings be tempered by whether the Russia's death definitely leads to good versus if it leads to bad. So for example, uh, and I'm going to make, I don't know if maybe you can make this argument, um, maybe you could argue with me, but Seems like, you know, bringing down the Nazi regime was objectively good, and that's going to lead to good, you know? But in this case, like we said before, like like this might lead, you know, Iran to retaliate, or this might make it harder to save the hostages. So should our feelings, you know, be tempered by this? So again, if we had more time, I would ask you what you think, but I just want to immediately go to the sources. Okay, so we, we're going to go to, to Brachos, and uh, the, there are three Mishnayos, and I'm only going to quote parts of them, okay? So this is background information. So on rain and on good news, we say the bracha of Hatova Meti. We say, blessed you, Hashem, or God, king of the universe, who is good and does good. Uh, and then on Baal Shmus, on bad news, we say, bracha to Hashem, okay, machalam, dayan ha'emes. Uh, blessed you, Hashem, or God, king of the universe, uh, the judge of truth, okay, or the true judge. There's a bit of a, a debate going on in the WhatsApp group, um, uh, not a debate, in the YBT WhatsApp group. Uh, Rabbi Zucker pointed out that it, the correct translation is the judge of truth. Um, uh, I'm not 100% convinced that that is the only way to read it, but I think most people say the true judge. Either way, so we have these two blessings that we say on when good stuff happens versus when bad stuff happens. Okay, Hatova Metiv, when good stuff happens, and Dayan Ha'emes, judge of truth, when bad stuff happens. Okay, next halacha. One who built a new house and one who purchased new items says, Blessed you are God, King of the universe, who gave us life, preserved us, and brought us to this time. Uh, and then the Mishnah says, one should bless over the bad as one blesses over the good, and over the good as one blesses over the bad. And it uses a weird Hebrew word here. Mavark ahara me'in ahatova, and ahatova me'in ahara. Okay, and th- that is a very ambiguous term, okay? Um, so the question is, what does that mean? And then in this last one, it says, um, oops, I... Did not translate this. Five Adam Levark Ahara Kashem Mavark Alatova. One is obligated to bless over the bad just as one blesses over the good. Okay. Shinemar, as it is stated, uh, you shall love Hashem, your God, with all your heart, uh, with all your soul, and with all your resources. Okay. I actually don't think I need the rest of this Mishnah. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to walk us through the Rambam on this, okay, uh, on and his commentary on these three things, okay, because I think this will shed light on our question. So on this first one, uh, no, not on this first one, on the third one, on he's going to explain what does it mean that you should bless over the bad as one blesses over the good. So he says like this, they said on the bad as on the good and on the good as on the bad. This means that if trouble comes upon him, even though what follows it is good, he blesses, uh, he makes the bracha of blessed is the judge of truth. So he makes the bracha for the bad. Okay. And this is as on the bad. Similarly, if good comes upon him, even though its ultimate end is bad, he blesses uh, bracha tova metiv, uh, the blessing on the good. And this is as on the good. He'll give examples now. A- an example of the first case is if a flood passes over his field. Okay. Passes over, meaning if your field gets flooded. This is bad because it destroys all your crops. Even though its ultimate end is good, as it waters his land, and perhaps the flood will bring benefits to his land, like it will replenish the soil or something. An example of the second case is if he finds money and another person sees him taking it, um, this is good 
even though its ultimate end is bad, as that person who saw him might inform the king, and the king will torture him and demand more from him than what he found. Okay, this is a good historical, uh, <laughs> you know, window into what used to happen when people would find uh, sums of money. You know, I don't think we worry about this now. Um, uh, another example of this I saw is if, let's say, uh, your a parent of yours dies, and you're going to inherit a lot of money. So even though you're going to get lots of money, you still say the bracha of Dayan Ha'emes because of the bad. Okay, now the question is, why, you know, why do we do this? And and especially, you know, the 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 definition of wise, according to the sages, one of the definitions, Ezehu Chacham Haro Esanolad, who is wise, one who sees the ultimate outcome of, of what's going to happen. So you would think that, you know, maybe someone who's wise would not make the blessing for the uh for the bad when his field is flooded maybe if he knows how fields work or whatever then he should make a blessing on the good because he knows it's going to be good okay so the question is why do you make a, a blessing on 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 uh, on the present so the ramam says the reason for this law is that there are present realities without doubt and therefore one blesses for what is happening now and does not look to the end because that end is possible and it is sufficient for the possible to remain possible in other words you make the bracha on the present because the present definitely is happening, okay? But the future is unknown. So that's why we favor the present over the future. So yes, a wise person will make decisions based on considering the future. That's the wise way to make decisions. But when you're praising God, you praise God based on what is happening right now because the future is unknown. So if what's happening right now is good, then you make the bracha of Hatova Metiv. And if what's happening right now is bad, you make the bracha of Dayan Ha'anas. Okay. Hold that thought. Ramam says more. Okay. He says, um, what does it mean when it says, just as you make a blessing on the good, you make a blessing on the bad, just as you make a blessing on the good. Uh, now, I just, I I thought I had a translation of this and I didn't. So I just used ChatGPT4. So there might be inaccuracies here. Just, they said, just as he blesses for the good, meaning that he should accept the good with joy and suppress his emotions and settle his mind when he blesses, when he makes the bracha blesses the true judge until it is like the time when he blesses, blesses is the good and the beneficent. Okay, sorry, I'm just going to say this in Hebrew because it's easier. So when something bad happens, then the ideal is you should say the bracha of Dayan Ha'emes, a blesses is the true judge, with the same emotional disposition as you do when you sit, when you bless God for something good that happened, okay? Which is very hard because obviously you're feeling a lot of bad emotions. Um as the sages often say in many of their matters, all that heaven does is for the good. This is an understood manner among the discerning, even without Torah warning about it, because many things are considered bad at first and uh, ultimately bring great good, and many things are considered good at first and ultimately bring great harm. Therefore, it is not fitting for a discerning person to be distressed when great trouble and a perilous decree come, because he does not know the ultimate outcome. Similarly, he should not be enticed and overly rejoice when good comes to him, according to his his thinking, because he does not know the ultimate outcome. Um, and thus they, peace be upon them, the sages, forbade excessive joy and laughter, except if, it, if that joy is in something exalted, meaning the doing and the pursuit of good. But the warning against sorrow and distress is very well known in the prophetic writings, so there's no need to elaborate on it. All this applies if the person had not been in a state of good fortune from beginning to end, and one might think that he is very fortunate. Oh, you know, I think this is a separate point here. Uh, okay, yeah, actually, I, I want to divide this as a separate point. Okay, so what is he saying here? So what he's saying is, you know, how do you achieve this state where when something bad happens, you bless Hashem on the bad of saying, blesses the true judge, but you have the same emotional disposition as you do when you're making the bracha on good? How do you, how do you like, you know, square that circle? So the answer is that the wiser you are, the more you will realize how you don't know what the outcome is going to be. And yes, what's happening now is bad, and that's why you make the bracha on the bad, and you're going to feel sad about it, but but you should aspire to, to rejoice in, in praising God for the bad, knowing that you cannot necessarily predict the outcome of what's going to happen. And the more you internalize that, awareness of you don't know what's going to happen the easier it is it is the easier it's going to be for you to to not freak out when something seemingly bad happens and to not freak out with with delirious joy when something seemingly good happens um and so 
So the Ram is giving you that as like the prescription. And again, I think this is an ideal to get to. Like you're, you're trying to get to the point where, where you're able to bless God with joy when you realize that everything that God does is for the good. That's a whole separate uh, you know, listen to last week if you want to understand what that means, uh, that everything that heaven does is for the good. Um, but applying this to our situation here, and then I'll open the floor for questions because I'm just trying to get this idea across uh, while we have the time. So going back to our, our Punnett square here, so is it possible that the deaths of Hania and Shakur are going to lead to bad? Yeah, it's definitely possible, okay? But I think the halacha that we just read supports the fact that we make the bracha of Hatova Metiv, which I did as soon as I heard the news. Okay, when um when when we find out that this guy who was the head of a terrorist organization that has been preying upon our our people is killed, right now that's good. And I think if you combine everything we've said, you know, I think the, the conclusion that I draw from this is that rejoicing over the downfall of an objective Russia is a good thing and you should celebrate and have joyous song because that is good for for the system and that's good for you and the celebration of it is good for the system. The only hesitation you should have is if by rejoicing over this guy's death, you're giving into some personal uh, egotistical emotion that is going to be bad for your development, then I think you should exercise restraint and additionally, I think that if um, oh, I had the other point, what was the other cause for restraint is, oh, and you should realize that, yes, this is a human life that was lost and and every human being has the potential to become good. So there is a loss of potential here. But I think if you can do that balancing act, I, I, I think that that what the Torah would say based on what the sources we've evaluated is that that like you know it there is a a good argument for rejoicing over the fact that these guys were killed and uh as long as you're not doing it in a way that's developmentally harmful i think that's like the conclusion that i drew from this okay open the floor for in the remaining seven minutes for questions comments on either of those halakhas or on the entire thing and if we have if, if you have more questions you could always contact me later but i want to stop on time tonight yeah david yeah, on the most recent thing you were saying before this, on uh, how to say in the same uh, in the same manner the Tov HaMetiv or the yeah. Dayan HaMet, um, I think that in that ability, which you're saying, like that wisdom to be able to do, I think that really comes from seeing that, like repetitive seeing these types of situations happen over and over and over again, where you think it's one way and then you see it's the other way. Yeah. And the more that you recognize that you are very short-sighted, the easier yeah. it is to take that step back at the outset exactly and that's why i know i've told this story a bajillion times but i'm gonna tell it again that's the whole story with the uh the farmer and the uh and the uh the thingy you know <laughs> i'll tell the story <laughs> the uh the, there was a poor farmer and he had a uh, only one horse and only one son and one day the horse ran away and he and and all the townspeople said oh what bad luck and he said good bad hard to say uh and, uh, and then the horse came back with a bunch of other horses and he had a increase in fortune and the townspeople said oh what good fortune and he said oh good bad it's hard to say and then the horse you know, flips the kid, the kid breaks the leg, and they're like, oh, that's bad. And it's like, good, bad, hard to say. And then the then the army comes in and takes all the able-bodied young men, and his his son is there. And the good, bad, hard to say, you know. So, yeah, the more cases you have of this, the more you realize that you the only one, and this gets back to Isaiah's point and David's point, the only one who who truly has knowledge of everything is God. And you don't have God's perspective, and you're never going to have God's perspective unless you a prophecy and, like, you can get prophetic insight into what the future is going to be. You know, and even the prophets didn't have the full picture. Um, and so the more you, examples of this you go over, then yeah, the easier it is to implement. I think that's a good point, David. Okay. Um, I'm just going to read what Raisa posted in the chat, which I did not have a chance to read before, uh, or unless Raisa, you want to say it. I can yeah. just read it. Yeah. yeah go ahead. Um, so this goes back. Can you hear me? Fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this goes back to, I think, the reconciling the two commissioners, I think. Yeah. They're called. Um, so I'm wondering if there is a an in like a built-in warning against how, like how herd mentality develops. Like if there's mm. more, like if it was written with the awareness that the individual can mm. learn more easily or like adapt their perception more easily, and like a group, like there's something about the um, echo chamber effect that like you really have to be aware of 
and it's like a different like you approach them differently yeah that was one of the things i i yeah i think that yeah. the uh this is the uh halak and the ramam that i i quote the most i think um i'm just gonna read it in english the, the he, man by nature is drawn after the uh character traits and actions of his associates and friends and he behaves in the manner of the people in his society therefore a person needs to befriend the righteous and to to spend time to sit near the wise constantly in order to learn from their actions and he should distance himself from the wicked who walk in darkness in order to not learn from their actions this is what solomon means when he says one who walks with the wise will become wise but one who befriends fools will become broken um and this is also what david says uh, in the first chapter and first verse of uh, of uh, psalms happy is the man who does not follow the counsel of the wicked etc so the, what the ram i'm saying here is that at the end of the day society is going to exert a uh, a stronger influence on you uh, i think because of the herd mentality reason and so so when it comes to society you know what they do when the when the wicked die it's very beneficial for society to rejoice um, uh, because that's going to, that's going to shape the morals and character traits of the people in the society. Yeah. Michael. Interesting. Um, if it's okay, I just, I, I thought of a Gemara, which I'm curious if you have immediate thoughts on if it uh, like sure. conflicts or is, uh, yeah. So it's in Moet Katan. So it, it quotes the passage about how David was like a, a rejoicing when Shaul died. And then uh, so Hashem tells David, uh, you're singing while uh, where, where is it? Mo Katan, where? Oh, it's a uh, Tesain on the base. Tesain on the base, okay. So and so it's like you're. Why are you singing when David's fallen? It says, "Il Malay Asa Shaul, who David? If you were Shaul and he was David, you oh. bought to come and David me panas. I would have destroyed many Davids before him." Wow, I am not familiar with that Gemara. That's really interesting, right? So I'm just going to yeah, read it again. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the Gemara elaborates. The Holy One blesses. He said to David, "David, why do you do you recite a song over the fall of Saul?" Had you had you been Saul and he were David, then I would have destroyed many Davids before him. Uh, and then the little commentary says, although I decreed that Saul's kingdom would not continue as an individual, he was far greater and more important than you. Wow. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Just to, yeah, Rashi says it's based on like their mazel, which I, I don't know what Rashi meant by. Oh, you can see him here. Um, I, I assume he means that like it's based on their circumstances. And like it doesn't mean that David was intrinsically better, just like he had better circumstances than uh, Shaul. Uh, interesting. So I'm, just, I'm curious if you think this conflicts with what we're saying or um yeah. you know what what i what yeah i mean uh, i i that makes me think of the 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 gemar about oh yeah i'm not gonna go to another one yeah i um i have to think about it i'd have to think about it i don't want to i don't want to weigh in right now because this is the first time i'm seeing this one but it's, it's good good to know about okay so in in conclusion um i uh i mean i kind of already summarized uh my uh my position here but i i think what we've seen is first of all that you know <laughs> like the name of the sheer I think there's a lot of uh, of overlap between Judaism and Stoicism, at least on this issue. I think that a lot of, I mean, I think it was, I did not know where our analysis of Marcus Aurelius would go, but I think a lot of the ideas that emerged from Marcus Aurelius uh, overlapped with a lot of the ideas we saw in Jewish sources. I do think that the Jewish sources um, put a little bit more emphasis on the impact on the development of you as a person or on uh, the society, which obviously Marcus Aurelius is not going to write about the development on society because this is his journal. Um, but uh, again, I, I personally think that um, you know, my, my own personal conclusion here is that we, it is good for us to feel good that this, that these two guys were killed. Um, as long as we keep all these points in mind about the loss of potential and the uncertainty of the future um, and the impact of our joy for good and for bad on ourselves and our society. So uh, that's the uh, that's the takeaway here. Okay, if you have any of the questions, then feel free to message me. And uh, thank you again for coming and have a good night. And enjoy the celebration. Celebrate. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.